Hi, it's Dr. Robert Gruley coming to you again with another segment of What's New in Cosmetic Surgery. Uh, I thought we'd spend a little time today talking about gynecomastia. Gynecomastia is male breast tissue. Uh, if you look here, you can see a vest on. I recently had some pseudo-gynecomastic tissue removed from my chest. Now, what is gynecomastia? It's nothing more than male breast tissue. Now there's pseudo-gynecomastia, which is basically fatty tissue accumulating in the breast area of men. Uh, there are a lot of different etiologies. In my case, it's because of some of the medications that I'm on that cause this to develop. True gynecomastia is male breast tissue, and, and yes, I've seen some men in my practice that have more breast tissue than a lot of women. And the question is, how do you treat it? Um, if it's pseudo-gynecomastia, it's, it's basically soft tissue. And what I generally do is, as an outpatient, uh, I go ahead and mess the area, that is, we put fluid in there to go ahead and get hemostasis and allow the suction apparatus to remove the fatty tissue uh, more expeditiously. Now, when you have true gynecomastia, then you may sometimes have to make an incision and actually do a direct excision or cutting it out. Now, I think the important thing to understand is if you suffer from gynecomastia, you've got to be careful where you go to get it treated. In many of the men that I see, they have excess skin. So the question is, you remove all that breast tissue, will the skin actually contract and look decent when you're without a shirt? That's a critical evaluation. The other thing I've seen in my practice, I've seen men go to uh, different individuals to get cool sculpting or some of these non-surgical treatments. And you've got to be very, very careful because if you truly do have male breast tissue, then cool sculpting will not help. It will not remove male breast tissue. So again, it's important to go to a board certified plastic surgeon who can make that differentiation and offer various treatment modalities. And again, if you go someplace and have a non-surgical removal of the fatty tissue, but then you're left with a big fold of skin, uh, I ask you at the end of the day, are you gonna be walking around the beach with this hanging, sagging, uh, envelope of skin uh, going on the beach. So be cautious, be wise. And, and realize one thing, that gynecomastia is a very, very common uh, problem that many, many men suffer from. So it's important to be careful in where you go and how you go about treating it uh, because there's some pitfalls that can occur because of it. I want to talk a little bit next about submental fat. Fat that's here in the <coughs> area below the chin. Uh, recently, a company got approval, Kythera Cabela, which is a deoxycholic acid, which is a normally occurring substance found in the body that can be used to go ahead and melt the fat away. I remember years and years ago, there was a young lady that worked out with me at the gym, and she said, Bob, you know, I just hate all this fat underneath my chin. And at the time, uh, I was doing some mesotherapy with deoxycholic acid and phosphatidylcholine. It was a combination. And what she would do is she would come in and we would do a series of about eight injections into that area to melt the fat. Well, after about four injections, she still had a fair amount of fat. And I said to her, I said, Pam, I don't know if a fifth injection is gonna make a difference, but we went ahead and did the fifth injection. And lo and behold, to my amazement, the fat was gone, but in its place were these platysmal bands. So in essence, the fat that was in the neck was hiding the bands of aging muscle underneath. In the neck, we have a muscle called the platysma. And normally that muscle decussates, it crosses. As we age, it separates and we get those columns. So you gotta be careful. You get the Kythera cabella you melt the fat, now you have less fullness, but you have these muscle bands. So it probably would be more efficacious in a younger person where the muscle's still intact and still decussates. And so it's, the other issue that I say to people <clears throat> is the cost of it. Uh, I recently read a gentleman who offering the service here in Fort Myers, and it's $1,400 an injection and he's discounting it to 1200, you need four to six injections. So let's do a compromise, let's do five injections. So five times 1200 is $6,000. You might as well have a neck lift. 
we can address the fat, we can address the muscles, get rid of all the loose skin, create a nice cervical mental angle. So in the end, is Kybella worth it, Kythera worth it? You be the judge. I think people have to be cautious uh, again because on the outside it seemed very plausible, uh, very appealing, no downtime. You come in, you get a little burning, a little pain, a little swelling, and my fat goes away. But it can be very expensive and you can be left with something less than ideal. So a word of caution in getting this treated with just injections. The next thing I'd like to talk about is, uh, you might say Botox on the cheap. A lot of times people call me and say, what do you charge for Botox? What do you charge for Dysport? And other neuroleptic agents. Uh, it's important to understand that Botox on the cheap is not necessarily in your best interest. I see a lot of practitioners that I think might be a little shady uh, because they'll advertise Botox to the forehead, $200. So the price of their Botox is pretty close to being what I pay. But what they do is, I usually charge based on the unit. So some people might need 20 units here, some people might need 30, 35. But I charge them based on the number of units that I use. Now what some practitioners will do, they'll say, Botox to any area, $150, $200. So what they do is they undertreat that area. So if it's $10 a unit, and it's $200, they might put in 20 units, but you might need 30 or 35. So that's one way of getting around it and getting people to come into their office, to their practice, by doing Botox on the cheap. But what's even worse is, and I've gotten emails and solicitations to buy black label Botox, Botox that's made who knows where, Somewhere in this world, somewhere in some country, uh, they're selling Botox on the cheap. Uh, and you got to be very, very careful as a patient going to somebody who's offering you Botox on the cheap and questioning where is it from. Now, the cost of manufacturing Botox really is very, very little. Uh, the markup is quite significant. So I just think as a consumer, I think it goes through with what we talked about before, you know, a couple of weeks ago we were talking about who should do plastic surgery, cosmetic surgery. And I think with the number of individuals offering cosmetic procedures, both surgical and non-surgical, as a consumer, you have to be extremely careful where you go. And again, that's why going to a board certified plastic surgeon, uh, I think is so vital, so important, and so critical for your best result and your safety and best interest. Another thing I want to talk a little bit about today, I read an interesting article uh, about mirror images. Okay, <clears throat> how many times do we get up in the morning and the first thing we do is we, we go to the bathroom and then we head in front of the mirror. And if you're a man, you might wash your face and shave a woman, wash your face, maybe put on some makeup after the shower, whatever. So we're looking in the mirror all the time when we go to the bathroom, make, do makeup, shave, fix our hair, do whatever it is we're doing. And our eyes get used to seeing that mirror image. And that's what we focus on. An interesting study was done in which they took women. Uh, I think there were about uh, 60, 70 women. It was done overseas. And 70% of women preferred the mere image of themselves versus a true image. Now, what's a true image? For example, somebody takes a picture of you, okay, and you see that photograph. That's a true image. But what you see in the mirror is not the same as what you see in a true photograph. It's called a mirror effect. And so the idea is we prefer, not just me, but you and all of us, prefer what we commonly see all the time. And for you and for me, it's that image that we see in the mirror. And so when we see a photograph of ourselves, then we do not prefer that versus the mirror image. And I think it goes to uh, a, a comment I made earlier. I, I was really kind of flabbergasted by the numbers. They did a survey in, in Dallas, Texas, and about 70, uh, seven percent, seventy-five percent of people had either had cosmetic surgery or were contemplating cosmetic surgery. And you know what the number one reason was 
and thank the good Lord for this, social media. In other words, uh, I talk to a lot of my patients when they come in and see me, they want to get a facelift or, or something along those lines, and I'll say, what motivated you to come in and seek out some cosmetic surgery? I can't tell you how many times women have come in and said, you know what, we were at a party, we were at a social event, and somebody was taking pictures and posting them on everyone's favorite Facebook. Or if you're a younger millennial generation, it might be Instagram. But they saw that image on Facebook, and their reaction to themselves was, oh my gosh, do I look that bad? And it's that motivation, that visualization of that picture that motivated people to go ahead and seek out cosmetic surgery. And what do you think was the number one area most people did not like about themselves? We talked a little bit earlier about non-surgical fat reduction. It was the neck. 40% of people wanted something done to their neck and they didn't like their profile and uh, and I see that in my practice I think that's very valid. A while back we talked about a procedure called the vampire facelift you know I'm always one of these people uh, people come in and talk about no incision facelift this guy has a name the prequel lift the this lift the that lift and it's just the name that people give surgeons give to a procedure that they quote pioneered uh, and I guess it's a way to inflate their ego or make them shine above everybody else that they've invented this new way to look instantly younger. And, and the vampire facelift was one of those things that was a non-surgical procedure that involved PRP. Now, I believe in PRP, and we're going to do some segments on PRP in microneedling, and I'll touch a little bit on it with this. But the vampire facelift has now transferred into the vampire breast lift. And again, what it involves is it involves taking of a patient's own blood, taking the PRP or platelet-rich plasma, and injecting it strategically into a woman's breast. Now, the treatments cost around $1,500, $1,800. And the idea is that by injecting the PRP, you're going to improve the collagen contact, stimulate stem cells to go ahead <clears throat> and create more fullness to the breast. Uh, supposedly, the results last up to two years. Uh, you may require more than one treatment. Um, one of the things that I'm doing in my practice more and more is I see women coming in with pseudotosis. In other words, their breast looks kind of tired. So what I recommend is maybe doing some PRP, take some of their own fat, mix them together, and augment the breast with their own fatty tissue. Now, if they have a limited supply of fatty tissue, we at the same time may want to put in a small implant and then cover that up and augment it with some of their own fat and PRP. Because I think at the end of the day, the PRP really does help to enhance the survival or the take of the fat. So it certainly is something to consider uh, because a composite oil can really give what I think is a more natural result versus just a straightforward oil. So again, the vampire breast lift and taking it one step further by putting PRP plus your own fat, I think makes a lot of sense. Again, I want to say thanks for, for listening to us today. And, and I certainly encourage you to give me your comments. Go to my website, Beauty by Brewing. Uh, the email address is rjbruick at abodyandface.com. So send me your comments. There may be a topic you have or a question you want to ask. Uh, I'm certainly available for you. Hope you have a wonderful week. Hope you had a great Halloween weekend. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon.